Welcome to Digging Deeper, Make Creativity Your Business Advantage. I'm your host, Jason Falls. Today on the program, I am super excited. My pal Mark Schaefer is here to talk about his new book, Cumulative Advantage. This is what it looks like. It's available in bookstores everywhere and on the Amazonians and all those places. It's his latest and is a fantastic investigation of the secret sauce that seems to make some people successful and others perhaps not so. He explains the concept of cumulative advantage in the book and how you can set yourself up to be successful with it rather than sitting by and watching other people do it while you don't. So we're going to dive in more and learn all about that today from Mark. He is a multiple times best-selling author, the man behind the popular marketing blog, business blog, Businesses Grow, and highly, highly sought after keynote speaker in the marketing ecosystem. He's also a fellow West Virginia mountaineer. We'll try not to gloat or burn any couches. By the way, that gives me a, a sidebar here. The University of Kentucky, congratulations to their volleyball team for winning the national championship this past weekend. But let me tell you, University of Kentucky fans, and I'm sitting here in Lexington, Kentucky, as I say this. University of Kentucky has tried to lay claim to the tradition of burning couches after a big sports win. Let me tell you something. Us Mountaineers have been burning couches since before UK fans around here could afford couches. So there. I'm sure that's probably going to ruffle some feathers in the office today. So I think I locked my door. I should be good until the show's over. Anyway, congratulations to the University of Kentucky volleyball team. First ever national championship for them and for an SEC volleyball program. So Woot, woot. Uh, at any rate, I also want to touch on a little snippet of influencer marketing this morning. I wrote a piece for uh, Entrepreneur last week about the SAG after influencer agreement. I'll fill you in a little bit more on what that is and why it leaves a lot to be desired coming up later in the program. If you have read my book, Influence: Reframing Influencer Marketing to Ignite Your Brand, uh, you know that I didn't spend a whole lot of time in the book describing a bunch of influencer marketing software programs, but I did mention one more frequently than others, and that platform is Julius. Uh, I have relied on Julius now for influencer discovery and campaign management for some time. When I'm looking for the right influencer for our clients at Cornette, Julius allows me to search across all the social media networks, including TikTok and Twitch and so on and so forth. When I click into an influencer's profile, I can see their audience demographics, what other channels they have reached through and so on. All of the pieces of campaign, campaign management are there too. It allows you to reach out, document contracts, share and approve influencer content, and of course, measure the ROI of not just your campaign, not just each individual influencer, but each individual post. You owe it to your brand or agency to do a demo of Julius today. Go to jason.online slash Julius and request one. That address again is jason.online slash Julius. Go check them out, folks. It's it's good. I use it literally every day. So it's, it's well worth at least the demo. That's all you got to do, just a demo. If you like it, great. If you don't, it's okay too. The demo is good. If uh, one more reminder, folks, if you're dialing in uh, to the live broadcast on LinkedIn, Facebook, YouTube, or Twitter, we're everywhere. You can jump in the comment section there or hit at reply on the Twitter video to ask questions and interact with us here on the show. Jump into the comments, say hello, and ask your question. I'll do my very best to integrate that as we move along. You can ask Mark Schaefer your question here on the program via me, and I won't censor or edit anything. I'll just read it and let him answer it how he so chooses. So jump in there and ask your questions, or at least say hello. Uh, jump over to see who's coming in on the live stream this morning. Uh, I see a few people. Chip Griffin says, just a quick hit and run hello. Uh, we've changed the time on him, so he can't sit and troll me the whole time. I'm sure that bothers him, but he does come by to say hello. So hello, Chip. Good to see you. Uh, there's a couple other people getting ready to pop in here. I can see the little bubbles as people are typing. So more folks are coming in there. Uh, Chip says, uh, hitting the button then am driving over to the ocean for a lobster roll with my kids. Well, that's about as trollish as you can get because now I'm jealous and want to be not in Lexington, Kentucky because lobster rolls around here, not exactly as fresh, but that's okay. Bob Farnham uh, is also here today, says, looking forward to hearing from Mark Schaefer. Well, in that case, I should shut the hell up and we should hear from Mark Schaefer. So let me hit a couple of buttons here and make that happen because it's time to welcome to the show, the man, the myth, the legend and author of the new book, Cumulative Advantage, Mark Schaefer. Good morning, Mark. How are you, sir? It's been a long time since I've called a myth, but I'll take it. <laughs> and I'm, uh, I'm here to verify uh, and testify that even as a young boy, I did see couches being burned on the streets of Morgantown, West Virginia. And you are not lying about that. No. 
I'm not exactly sure where that uh, that trend here in UK in the UK world started to happen, but they started saying, "Well, we burn couches, and we're the only ones yeah. we invented it." And I'm like, "Get hmm. out of here! Get out of here! Get out of town, Lexington, Kentucky!" Exactly. Look, exactly. And, and believe me, you don't want to go down that dark hole anyway. <laughs> <laughs> It's a you know because of conference affiliations over the years. I'm a little disappointed that West Virginia and UK don't have a little bit more of a rivalry. Yeah, they should. They should. I mean, I'm I'm from Logan, West Virginia, over in the Southern Coalfields. Then grew up in Pikeville, Kentucky. So I would be the perfect like split household kind of guy, of course. Yeah. But I guess the conference affiliations over the years, and for a while, West Virginia was not in a you know a bigger conference than like the SEC, and so I think that had something to do with it. But they they should figure that out. Anyway. Yeah, not to make anybody in Lexington mad, but I mean, it would give West Virginia an extra win every year. <laughs> okay, he said it, not me. So you guys stay out in the hallway and don't throw crap at me while I'm doing the show. Yeah. All right, Mark, cumulative advantage. The premise of this book is really to help people understand how some people seem to succeed in repetition, one big hit after another while others don't or perhaps don't do so with as much explosion. You use an interesting analogy throughout the book to help kind of underline that comparing your own success as a marketing consultant to Tim Ferriss. Give everyone a sense of why that parallel kind of describes what cumulative advantage is. Well, as I was researching this book, um, you know, I was looking for examples of sort of unexpected momentum. So I did this research that exposed these patterns of momentum that repeat over and over again with individuals and with uh, companies. And so somehow I just started thinking about Tim Ferriss and I wondered, you know, where did this guy come from? Because he is like a, a success machine. I mean, everything he touches just, you know, explodes into more and more notoriety and fame. And I started reading about him. I thought, I just don't get it. I just don't get it. Uh, there was nothing that would have predicted his success. And, and I'm not saying anything he hasn't said himself. He's been very, very transparent. But at the time he wrote his book, his first book, which, you know, Four Hour Work Week, huge New York Times bestseller. Well, I think it was on the bestseller list for like, I don't know, 500 weeks or I don't know, something like that, some ridiculous number. I mean, he had had psychological problems and physical problems and relationship problems and business problems. He was burned out. He was stressed out. He dropped out, went to Europe to try to find himself, had this idea for a book. It was rejected by 26 publishers. <laughs> and here we are uh, a few years later, and he's hanging out with LeBron James. Mm -hmm. He's hanging out with Oprah. And so as I started to see something crazy happened here because nobody would have bet on this guy. And sure enough, Jason, um, it follows those patterns. It follows these predictable patterns that lead to momentum. And I almost couldn't have written a better script. And, and we see this over and over again. And I thought this would be fun to kind of show why does Tim Ferriss know Oprah and I don't? Because we, <laughs> sort of, we both sort of started at the same time and I think if you were a, a betting person, which I know you've been known to bet a few times, would you have bet on Ferris or me? You probably would have bet on me and you would have lost. And so this book explores in a fun way. It's sort of a whimsical literary device to, to show how this momentum works sure. and why Tim made it to Oprah orbit. And I did not. Well, it's interesting that you chose Tim Ferriss. And the reason that I was you know, kind of furling my brow a little bit there, because I, I want to toss this back at you. And this is much more about Tim Ferriss than it is about cumulative advantage in your book. But I've always had a bit of a beef with him and the four hour work week. No doubt. I mean, the book is one of the seminal productivity books of our time. You know, like you said, it sold something like four million copies, launched him into this crazy stratosphere of success. But my beef with him in the book might contradict your insertion of him into your story a little bit. So just bear with me here. All right. And, th and this might be the small town, you know, West Virginia, Kentucky kid coming out uh, who doesn't live in that, that stratosphere. So maybe that's it. But you assert in your book that the four hour work week was a, a, his big sonic boom. And the idea for it was his initial advantage. We'll talk about those steps in a second. But my beef with the book was this. 
His book promises to tell people how one can achieve the millionaire lifestyle of complete freedom without having the first million dollars. He sells it by saying, how did I go from 14 hour days and 40,000 per year to four hour work weeks and 40,000 per month? But then he starts the book and very early in the book with this sentence, roughly, I'm paraphrasing a bit, but this is in the book. I was asked by my former professor at Princeton University to speak about the highly profitable sports supplement company I started. That was before the four hour work week. So you're telling me that you couldn't figure out how this guy had a predictable path to success. And he's an Ivy League grad who started a supplement company, which means he's got investors. He's got money. So I never read past that point in the four hour work week. I've never read it because I thought this is bullshit. I'm not going to read this. Well, it, you know, the, the, the Princeton thing is actually interesting because, you know, he grew up. The, the, my perspective on this was, I mean, that certainly was part of his initial advantage, but he grew up in a very modest household and actually was funded through Princeton by his grandparents. Okay. And, uh, you know, so, I mean, I, I think, you know, uh, he, he had some good fortune there and, you know, I, I think everybody does to, to some degree, or that's how you build advantage. Advantage leads to, leads to advantage. But the thing that was also curious about that is um, if you see what his degree was in, it was something bizarre. You know, it was something about, you know, I, I, I con, you know, icons in the Japanese <laughs> language, right? It was a Asian language studies. Okay. So, you know, number one, he, he did grow up in a very modest house told i point to his real initial advantage is that his parents bought him whatever books he wanted mm -hmm. and so he became he was he was he was uh very sickly as a child he was bullied as a child uh he lacked confidence uh he and this is again i'm not you know just dis dismissing tim ferris uh but you know he kind of got a lucky break that his grandparents paid for and had league education. That was pretty cool. And in a way, he kind of blew it because he studied some bizarre language thing. Uh, and then he started this new the supplement company, but the, the, the company kind of was destroyed mm -hmm. and he ran into all kinds of financial problems. And that's why he went to Europe because he was burned out. And, uh, you know, he, 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 he just thought there, there should be, and I'm, by the way, I'm with you. I'm not a particular fan of his book. <laughs> <laughs> well, as Chip, as Chip Griffith says, nobody can argue about the success, but the title of the book is really what misleads people because Tim yeah. himself does not work four hours a week. No, uh, he, and, he would spend and, more time than that just promoting the book. I think the interesting thing about Tim is that, uh, he, he you're right. I mean, he, he's a, he's a workaholic. Mm -hmm. which is what led to his problems in the first place. Yep. And, but now here's the interesting thing that's, that's, that's happening. It, it's very sort of kind of meta in a way. So at the end of my book, I talk about really what sort of made our paths diverge. I mean, there was a lot of things and I, I just kind of kept it simple, but the main thing that, that made it diverge is what I was writing about in those early days was influence marketing, right? I kind of saw this path light up and I was into the early days of clout and all this stuff. And I said, there's something here. And instead of becoming the go-to guy for influence and creating influence agencies, blah, 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 there was, I, I couldn't even stand to think of that idea. <laughs> I, 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 I'm, I, I light up by trying new things, by discovering new things. Now, so I stepped away. Now, here's the interesting thing. Ferris did the opposite thing. He created a franchise around the four hour. So he kept going, he kept going, he kept going. And now he stepped away, yep. you know, and he, and again, he, he's very transparent about this. And he, he said, look, I'm getting into the same bad habits. And now he's he's really stepped away from a lot of that fame and a lot of that treadmill, and and so it, it, it's like I did the same thing. I, I stepped away because it was a lifestyle choice for me, and I think he's stepping away because it's a lifestyle choice for him. So it's it's it it all kind of kind of comes together in an interesting way. 
So I mentioned the initial advantage and the sonic boom, but I skipped a few. Uh, and I, I don't want to do your book much better service. So I didn't want to bring you here to talk about Tim Ferriss all day. Uh, so take us through the cycle of cumulative advantage and help us understand what to look for along the way to maybe identify our own opportunities to jump into that cycle. Well, I think it's really exciting and it's it's a book of hope because what I show is that there are lots of examples where people create momentum. In fact, almost in every case, people create momentum from something random. And and I mean, I, I know a little bit about your career and you were in some interesting situations that kind of led to where you are. And as, as I talk about in my book, I can directly draw a line between a conversation I had with my boss in maybe like 1992, asking him for an AOL account and, and the reason I'm talking to you today, right? Yeah. One random conversation, but here's the key. I saw opportunities in business applications of the internet and not a lot of people were talking about it back then. It's like, you've got mail. That was the big thing, right? And I started thinking forward on this and I was the first person at this Fortune 100 company with an internet account. I put it, got an expense account, you know, I, line item for AOL. <laughs> so it wasn't just an idea. I pursued the idea. Now, what happened next? There's a fracture in the status quo. The internet is going to change everything. In my book, I call that a scene, right? It, it, it could be a big opportunity. It could be a small opportunity. It could be a change in fashion and habits in taste, in, in demographic shift, in economics, right? Now, what's happening in our world right now? The pandemic. It's the greatest fracture in the status quo probably in history other than maybe a world war or something. But everything is changing. How we work, how we play, how we connect, how we educate our children, how we work out, right? I was talking to a guy from Adidas he said the pandemic is redefining sport. Mm -hmm. So this is a fracture in the status quo. Those are all business opportunities. And, and, and what we need to do is see how do we apply our strengths, our competencies, whatever initial advantage that we have to these opportunities. And if it fits, you go. You, you go through this as fast as you can, as hard as you can. I think Clubhouse is an interesting example that maybe a lot of your listeners and viewers today can relate to, right? Would Clubhouse exist without the pandemic? We have a lot of people who are lonely, isolated. They need to talk to people and they have a lot of time on their hands because we had 20 million unemployed people in the country. Now, what are they trying to do? Facebook is coming out with an audio app. LinkedIn's come out with an audio app. Twitter already has an audio app and they're coming after them. So what does Clubhouse have to do? They've got to go, go, go as fast as they can to establish themselves in this fracture and you know blow these other people away. And that's how they're going to win. They got to go through that seam right now. It's not a two year plan. It's right now. And that's how I think we need to think about business opportunity today and more importantly, momentum. So what about the people who know they're onto something good or think they're onto something good, but work for months and years and don't seem to find the scene? What, are they doing something wrong? Well, you know, may, or it, it could be that the offering is, is a miss in some way, or it could be that the world is just telling them, you know, it's not working. I mean, I do a lot of individual, you know, business coaching. And I was talking to a fella maybe two weeks ago and he's been, working, working, working on this certain business idea for like 10 years. And the guy has put his heart and soul into it. And he seems to be doing everything right. And it's just not catching fire. And at some point, I think you have to listen to the world mm -hmm. and, and say, well, maybe, maybe the seam isn't there. There are also examples I have in my book where, I mean, even in my own life, where I had a certain idea and it didn't work. <clears throat> And 10 years later, it did. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't because the idea was wrong. Right. It's because the timing wasn't wrong. Was it right? Uh, a famous example, Thomas Edison creating the light bulb. He actually delayed the, the, the work on the light bulb by 10 years. Other people were working on it. He said, the economics aren't right. 
you know, the economic, and when he saw that the infrastructure was going to be ready for this, he went through this with everything he had, put everything into it to go through that seam, and eventually he won. You know, while you were saying that, it actually reminded me in uh, 2008, I, I recommended a content marketing strategy to an alcohol brand that I was working with at the time. And they looked at me like I had three heads. They're like, why would we ever write about anything other than alcohol? I was like, well, so you can attract an audience that might be interested in the alcohol, but they didn't, the content marketing wasn't as big of a deal then. They didn't quite understand it. I pitched the exact same idea to a different brand three years ago. And it's the primary thing that they do now. Yeah. From content perspective. Yeah. I mean, that's, I, I think that's a great example. I mean, it, you were, you were just, you know, maybe you were ahead of your time. Maybe your customer was a little behind the times, but yet, yeah, so time, timing is a big deal. Timing, timing is everything. Yep. Sure is. Now you do talk about uh, the black keys in the book. And I think you, you asked Patrick Karn, the drummer about their sonic boom moment. And he said, there just wasn't one. I, I, I I'd propose a slightly different angle to this. I think there are there certainly can be the big viral moment sonic boom, uh, like the Tim Ferriss thing, but I think it can also be a success of little booms too. Mm -hmm. Like you know, my influencer marketing podcast is something I knew I needed to invest in for the long haul. I wasn't going to have a monetizable audience overnight. I knew that I had to nurture it along and be patient and consistent. Yeah, but right. then I was fortunate enough to be invited on a couple of fairly sizable podcasts where the podcast listening audience was predicated to like that type of content and interested in influencer marketing. So I had a couple of nice step up spikes, you know, and that's how my old blog social media explorer was too. Mm -hmm. So does it have to be a sonic boom or can it be a long series of what was that noise? No, I mean, I think what you're saying is exactly, uh, it works with what I was talking about in the book. So the first chapter was about sonic boom. Then in the next chapter, I talk about how this is associated with your own personal power and brand. All right. So what you're saying is you started this thing out and then you said you got invited to some sizable podcasts that wouldn't have happened if you hadn't started something that wouldn't have happened if you hadn't been diligently working on your personal brand. Now, if you keep on doing that, you'll be invited to even bigger podcasts. You have bigger opportunities, right? So you're right. You know, if you're just starting out, you might have a sonic whisper. <laughs> <laughs> and that's fine. Yeah. Because it builds, it builds, it builds, right? And as your brand grows, as your podcast grows, you get invited to bigger and bigger things. And that, so your ability to attract that attention grows. And, and, and that's, so the Black Keys were saying, look, you know, it seems like we're an overnight success, but you know, at that time they're telling me we've been touring for seven years. Yeah. We've been, we've created seven albums and it's just like you year one. It's a sonic whisper year two. They're getting on some podcasts mm -hmm. year three. They're getting invited to, you know, Lollapalooza mm -hmm. year four. It's bigger, bigger, bigger. So there is definitely a correlation between your work, your personal work and your ability to attract and create that something bigger and, and more profound. You know, I think the, the thing that struck me about this book the most is that it's very different from your other books. This isn't really about marketing. It's about entrepreneurship. Do you, do you agree with that? It, yeah, it's, I mean, it applies to marketing in some ways because I think marketing is about momentum. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the thing that preoccupies me is that what's the, what's the only question in marketing today? What is the only question? How can we be heard? How can we be seen? How can, I mean, that's it. That, that's, that is the theme of every single book, marketing book written in the last 10 years, mm -hmm. including mine, including yours. <laughs> How can we be seen? Whether it's influencers, whether it's, you know, marketing rebellion, whether it's personal branding, that's it. And so, you know, we're in this period, Jason, where there's so much competition and there's so much noise. Even if you're great, you're being buried. Yep. How do you transcend that? I'm obsessed with this idea. How do you transcend all these odds that are stacked against you, including Google, right? Including your competitors. And so I think this idea of momentum is relevant to, to, to marketing, but you're right. You know, uh, we have a mutual friend, Jeff Bullis, 
and uh, he and I, I got to talk to him a few weeks ago. That he's down in Sydney, Australia, and he said, "Mark, you did something very tricky with this book." He said, "I started reading this, and I definitely see this as an interesting marketing book. But by the end of the book, I realized you're teaching us how to be a better human being." <laughs> there you go. Yeah, that, that sounds about right. I would, so I'll take I would, that. I'll take that too. I would concur with that. All right, let me switch gears uh, uh, with you a little bit here. You wrote one of the first books about influence marketing, Return on Influence. Uh, and you talked a little bit about that and your relationship with Joe Fernandez, the CEO of Clout, in this book. Since you wrote that book, I think the influencer space has evolved quite a bit and matured into something more around online influence. Today, everyone does that to some degree, and it's less about a single number like a Clout score and more about seeing influencers as these multifaceted assets, audience holders, content creators, et cetera. How do you think influencer marketing has changed in just the short time since Return on Influence came out? Well, I think it's changed in very interesting and profound ways. I think the thing that's more interesting is what hasn't changed. And that is that power and influence really only comes from one thing, and that is the ability to move content, right? To move an idea. If you have an audience that trusts you and, and will listen to you and your ideas and you, know, you say, look, I love this brand. I think you should love it too. I'm inspired by this idea. I think this will inspire you. I, this made me laugh. I wanna share this with you. That's it. Power on the web derives from one thing. Now. All the changes that we see in influence marketing really shoot off that core. The mm -hmm. core idea, the core measurement, Clout had it right, right? And, and, and everybody hated them in the day. <laughs> but I mean, they had it right. They were on to something. Can we see how content moves? Yes. Can we see who moves it? Yes. Those are the people with power. Now, how do they do it? TikTok, how big is their audience? How much are they engaged? Mm -hmm. You know, those are all offshoots. And, and, and one of the things I wrote about recently, uh, you know, and be interesting to get your view on this, is that I think the biggest change I see is that when you and I were starting out in the business and, and influence period was becoming a thing, it was based on authority, right? Mm -hmm. So you write about bourbon, you know, maybe someone writes about sports. They write about fashion. They do, right. you know, interior decorating. That's how you create your authority. Brands identify with whatever this is. Oh my gosh, you own this audience that loves bourbon, that loves sports. I want to be with you. The new generation coming up, they're creating their their presence by by celebrity, mm -hmm. by entertainment. All right. They're, they're, they dance on TikTok. They do, they do practical jokes, right? So it's less authority based and more celebrity based. Mm -hmm. And that's what they aspire to celebrity, not authority. Now, I'm not being critical of this. I think it's amazing for any young person mm -hmm. that can show their art and share their, their heart and their love with the world. Beautiful. Go for it. But it is different. And I think there are interesting implications for brands here. Yeah, I would agree with that. I, I think it's, you know, for the, the only thing that I would change about that is instead of celebrity, although I think that's kind of what fuels them a little bit, it's less celebrity and more talent. I think there are people they're who are expressing. They're entertainers. Yeah, they're entertainers. Absolutely. Yeah. But um, I, think, and, I think this is the minor leagues for Hollywood. Yeah, I, I think that's I think absolutely. it's inevitable. I think that's absolutely true. And it might be that your distinction there between the entertainer and the authority um, or the celebrity and the authority might be the difference between what the mainstream media sees and portrays as so negative about influencer marketing yes. because they yeah. see it as the minor leagues for yes. Hollywood um, and the part of the influencer marketing world that I see every day, which is based on authority. Because when I'm talking to Derek Wolf at Over the Fire Cooking, right. who partners with Buffalo Trace on content, He's an authority on how to cook delicious meals over a fire. He's yeah. not dancing on TikTok. If he is, yeah. that's a supplement that's to his authority. And me, as we work with brands, because a lot of people roll this idea of influencer into one idea. Yep. And it's not, you know, 
you want to connect with Kim Kardashian or or George Clooney for a certain reason because they have an image. Mm -hmm. It's not on authority. Mm -hmm. It's on image. And that's legit. Mm -hmm. It's legit, right? Now, when you, you can't think about all influencers being equal because if the TikTok stars, they're aspiring to celebrity, not authority. Right. So you need to connect. Your goal has to be different. You can't roll all these people into saying, oh, they're influencers. Oh, wait a minute. Are they authority mm -hmm. or are they an entertainer? Yeah. Most That's influence it. today in the, in, in the, in the, the up and comers, it's entertainment. Let's call it what it is. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a, a good delineation and distinction. So I'm sure that uh, we'll both be noodling on that and coming up with more thoughts on it as we move on. Uh, do you see influencers eventually becoming a primary channel of marketing for brands alongside maybe own social media, public relations, online media, print, oh, et cetera? Oh, absolutely. Oh, 100%. Mm -hmm. It's just beginning. It's just beginning. And, you know, you made this this interesting comment, Jason. You said, well, the media dwells on, you know, the entertainers. The media is going to dwell on the stupid stuff, right? <laughs> but you know what? There's stupid stuff everywhere. There's stupid stuff in SEO. Mm -hmm. There's stupid stuff in digital advertising and corruption in digital advertising. There's corruption in podcast numbers, right? There's corruption everywhere. And so, so, but look, overall, people don't listen to ads. They don't trust ads. Mm -hmm. Increasingly, they see ads less and less and less because we're moving into a streaming content society. You know, for, for young people today, their advertising consumption is down 95% compared to where it was just, you know, five years ago. Who mm -hmm. do we listen to? Our friends, the yep. people that we trust. Who are our friends? Our neighbors, our family. And really, that's who influencers are. Yep. It's a trusted you know, parasocial relationship that we trust them because in our mind, we consider them a friend. And that's why influencer marketing is, it's just starting. It's going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. Well, the book is called cumulative advantage. It looks like this. It's a beautiful book. It's a, uh, I've read it twice now. I read it when I first got it. And then I read it again this last weekend to make sure that I didn't forget anything to talk to you about. Izzy House just jumped in and said, the book has great stuff, but the ending is amazing and impactful here, here. So you owe it to yourself, folks out there to go get Cumulative Advantage by Mark Schaefer. It's fantastic. And it will definitely uh, help you think about your life, your business, your marketing a lot differently. So Mark, last question for you. Where, uh, when, when are you and I going to make enough money to buy the pirates so we can stop sucking so much? Hey, they're they're doing all right. They're at five hundred right now, which is better than I ever imagined. Mark, it's April. They're always okay for the first three I'm weeks okay. of the season. They're better than they were than I thought they'd be even in April. <laughs> yeah, I just I just hate when we get a, a decent star player. They auction them off and feed the farm the farm team. I know that's what small market teams have to do, but it just yeah, it yeah. frustrates me. But yeah, as long as you can be a fan as long as there's hope. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so sometimes I don't, that. sometimes I don't think there's hope anymore. Though. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Mark, where can people find you and the book on the interwebs? Super easy. If you can remember businesses grow, you can find me and my blog and my podcast and my books and all my social media connections, businessesgrow.com. Very good. I put that link as well as a link to you on LinkedIn and a link to cumulative advantage on Amazon in the chat section. And we'll, those will be in the show notes as well. Mark, always great to talk to you. Great to have you on the show. I really appreciate you being here today. The book is fantastic. I hope it's another bestseller for you, man. Thank you, Jason. All right. Mark Schaefer, ladies and gentlemen, how about that? Good stuff. Love having him on the show. Love talking to Mark. Obviously we have a lot in common with the Pittsburgh Pirates and not letting the conversation derail to just two buddies sitting around talking about stuff because that's what normally happens when we get together. So great to have him on the show. Go get the book, Cumulative Advantage. Fantastic book. I've read it twice. And I think those of you who know me know that I can count on one hand how many books I've read twice because sometimes I struggle getting through the first read through. But uh, great book, great read. And I read the whole thing over the weekend. So it's, it's a good, easy read too. Okay, uh, I'm still hoping all of you will also get a copy of my new book, Winfluence, which is available in bookstores everywhere on Amazon and other online retailers too. It is available in paperback on Kindle and now via audiobook. I've got to 
thing to push there. Now via audiobook. So you can go to audible, jason.online slash audiobook. That'll take you right to Audible. And and I am the narrator. So if you if you like that that syrupy southern twang talking to you about influencers and marketing, then you can go listen to me talk about the book. I'll read the book to you. Uh, if you put it on at a certain time of the day, yes, I will read you to sleep. Uh, I hope the book doesn't read you to sleep. I hope it's just, you know, you're tired, but whatever. Um, if you want the Kindle or Amazon links, those are at jason.online slash get the book. Do I have a thing for that? I don't have a thing for that. Jason.online slash get the book. But if you want the book hard copy and would like a 20% discount, I do have something for that. Where'd that go? That's right here. Turn that off and turn that on. Uh, if you go to jason.online slash buy Winfluence, uh, you buy that there. That's the Entrepreneur uh, Press uh, website where you can buy the book. And uh, that's where we can control the discount codes. So Falls 20 still works. It, it'll get you 20% off. So check that out if you want a discount off of the, the hard copy. Where did I put the hard copy? I don't know. Oh, it's behind me. It's back here. Here's the hard copy. And it's, of course, it's over my shoulder. If you want that, then do that Falls 20 thing. If you want the audio book, you can go to the audio book version. I appreciate you take a look at that. Okay, uh, so in February, the Screen Actors Guild and Association of Federated uh, Television and Radio Artists, or SAG-AFTRA in the trades, uh, it announced that it would allow social media influencer work to count toward a member's benefits and qualified work. The headlines at the time were all giddy that influencers could now get benefits like health care and pensions since the unions that govern a lot of entertainers, actors and such, we're now covering influencers. But if you look deeper, that's not really what's happening. SAG-AFTRA is a labor union that looks out for performers of on-camera or on-microphone media. They did not announce influencers could now be members of their union. They announced their members could submit social media influencer work to count toward their benefits. This was a way for a traditional celebrity type, a Hollywood actor really, to be able to use brand deals for Instagram and YouTube and such to count toward the dues they pay, the money they're credited with, uh, and the, uh, the benefit from uh, the pensions and health care uh, that they have to do a certain amount of work in order to qualify for that. So now that can qualify. This was SAG looking out for SAG, not influencers. Now, the good news is that non-SAG after members can now join the union and provided they make enough money from creating content for social networks through brands, they can put that toward qualifying for benefits. But the only content creators out there who can really afford the dues and be willing to give into the percentage that the union takes from every contract you score are the ones making hundreds of thousands of dollars per year doing it. Again, this was not for influencers. This was for SAG members. I covered the story in more depth, uh, more full reporting with input and quotes from a few other people that are uh, you know, instrumental in that world over at entrepreneur.com. You can see the story at the link that I'm going to drop into the comment section now. I'll make sure the link is also on the show notes, of course, as well. I even talked to the SAG team, though they didn't want me to quote them directly without them approving the quote. So, no. Uh, but I'd love uh, to... I'd love to read for you now how I wound up that story because I think it's an opportunity for someone out there to step in and move the industry forward. So here's my conclusion to that piece. And clear my throat there. The SAG after model is frankly one that would do the influencer marketing industry good. It needs a creator first organization. Yes, a union to ensure the entrepreneurs who earn their living creating engaging content on social media channels have protections resources, and benefits. And as the SAG-AFTRA agreement underlines, no union exists that can rightfully cover all the different aspects of what an influencer profession entails. Influencers are a new breed of professional with needs other unions cannot meet. Imagine there was an influencer union, one that covered all aspects of being a digital content creator, not just on camera or microphone work. An influencer could join and pay dues to carry an influencer union card. Any engagement with a client would include, let's say, a 10 or 20 percent fee to be paid to the union. The union could survey its members then to set common pricing standards for various type of work with a scalable fee for various sizes, sizes of a given influencer's audience and or engagement rates. Those content creators who didn't want to join wouldn't have to, and brands could elect to use non-union creators and influencers if they wished. 
But those high quality producers making a career out of it would be more apt to join the union for the benefits it offers. So brands would tend to want to use union talent because it's better talent. If anything, SAG-AFTRA has opened the door to some content creators, though most of those uh, who will benefit are their current members. You can't fault them for looking out for their own first, and we should give them a nod for taking a step, even if it's a baby one toward making the entrepreneurial avenue of online content creation more viable. You can read the full article over on entrepreneur.com. Just follow the link I've dropped into the chat session if you're watching with us live, or I'll include that in the show notes over at teamcornet.com afterwards. Just click on news once you're there and look for the episode on Mark Schaefer. If you're watching or listening, watching, watching, that's not even a word. If you're watching or listening to the show, not during the 11 a.m. Eastern time hour on Tuesdays, you've not joined us live. Remember, we broadcast this podcast with a live stream to join us live. Just follow me or Cornette on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, or look for Digging Deeper on YouTube. And you'll get that handy live notification when we stream. That's normally at 11 a.m. Eastern, 8 a.m. Pacific on Tuesday mornings. You can look for me online at Jason Falls and typically find Cornette online at Team Cornette. Um, and if you want to subscribe to the YouTube channel, the Digging Deeper YouTube channel is found easily at cornette.online slash dig deep. You can also catch the show as an audio podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, Pandora, and more. Find an easy link to subscribe to the audio version of the show at cornet.online slash digging deeper. So spell it all the way out if you want the audio stuff. Just use dig deep after cornet.online slash, and that will take you to the YouTube channel. Very easy way to find us and subscribe. I hope you do and come back often. Next week on the show, Morgan Brown will be with us. He is the Vice President of Growth for Shopify. We're going to get deep into e-commerce, how Shopify is growing and serving its direct-to-consumer customers and what the future of commerce has in store for us all. That will be live on the interwebs on Tuesday, May the 4th at 11 a.m. Eastern, 8 a.m. Pacific. If you can't be there live, subscribe to our YouTube channel at cornet.online slash dig deep and watch the replay on demand, or you can subscribe to the audio feed via podcast at cornet.online slash digging deeper. And here we go with the multiple buttons Jason has to push to close out the show and send you off for the rest of your Tuesday. That'll do it for this edition of Digging Deeper. Make creativity your business advantage. If you like the episode, share it with a friend or colleague who might as well. Digging Deeper is a production of the Cornette Group. Find us online at teamcornette.com. Our executive producer is Christy Heiler, creative director, Jason Majeski. Associate producer is Ashley Harris. Our theme music is composed by Rex Banner. I'm your host, Jason Falls for Mark Schaefer. I'm wishing you a wonderful Tuesday. Thanks for joining us, folks. Until next time, I'll see you on the interwebs.